I'm going to uh, introduce uh, Michael Wesch again. I'm not going to do the full introduction because many of you were here for the morning talk. But uh, for those of you who weren't, uh, you probably should know that uh, Michael Wesch is an assistant professor of anthropology at Kansas State University, where he's been since 2004 after receiving his PhD in anthropology from the University of Virginia. He is, uh, his area of uh, study is exactly the topic of our com uh, conference, and that is how uh, the new media is affecting society and our culture. And he's uh, been involved in all kinds of teaching projects and teaching initiatives to help us understand how, to, how the new media is changing the way we think and the way our students think. So without uh, any more introduction, I'll turn it over to Michael. All right. Um, so I, I left you guys last time with this uh, idea that this, this new media scape is essentially what we make of it and we as teachers have an especially strong responsibility in this. And I want to really like sort of up the ante here and tell you about why this is so important to me and it comes all the way back to my field work in Papua New Guinea. So I'm actually going to tell you a story about how I got started in studying digital media, and it might surprise you that it started in a place where they've never seen digital media. Um, so we're gonna, I'll, I'm gonna do like a little virtual fieldwork experience, and I hope most of you are almost done eating because you're about to see some of the things that they eat, and it might not be so appetizing. <laughs> but here we go. We're gonna fly into the middle of the island here. It takes you about two weeks to two months to get to this airstrip here because normally uh, you fly into Sydney, then you go into the capital city, and then you have to wait for a little Cessna, uh, usually you have to wait till some gold prospector or missionary, somebody like that might be flying in. Um, so you get into this little airstrip here and then you walk for a couple days and you end up in villages like this. And these are the places I was going summer after summer during my graduate, uh, graduate school. And so you end up in villages like this and these villages have no running water, no electricity, um, no, there's no 3G access, there's no internet. There's nothing like that. So it's really totally disconnected. And they grow all their own food. So yeah, in fact, most of them ha uh, don't have any money. Yeah, so they grow all of their own food. They have taro, sweet potato. You see bananas back there. This would be like a big feast for them. This is actually the delicious part that I'm showing you. This is like the pig and taro, sweet potato, some greens, things like that. But they're also pretty, uh, what's the right word? Um, I don't know, they are strategic and, and opportunistic. So after a big rain, for example, all the spiders wash out from the forest canopy and then they can harvest the, the eggs and the spiders and they eat those. Um, they also eat snakes whenever they get a chance. And this is actually a two for one deal because usually the snake, you know, after they get it right after it's eaten and that way, you know, the snake's kind of lazy and just laying around there and then they can capture it and they get what, what the snake just ate. They can eat that as well as the snake itself. So they get this two-for-one deal out of that. And I, I show you this picture because that, that snake was found about 100 feet from where I was staying, which is this house over here. And this is just after I first arrived. This is just like a week after I first arrived. And uh, this is actually, these are actually my legs up here in the corner. This is my sleeping bag. And just to give you a sense of what it looks like on the inside there, um, every night, you know, you go to bed and you have these great conversations around the fire and that kind of thing. Actually, in the first week, you notice that everybody else is having great conversations because you don't actually speak the language, which is a problem. <laughs> but, but so you're all sitting around the campfire, and then at night, you start to see all the bugs come out and the rats and all that stuff. And so I used to wrap myself up in my sleeping bag just as tight as I could to protect myself from the elements. Um, but it's the tropics, so inevitably my sleeping bag would come off of me in the middle of the night, and all these bugs would be all over me and that kind of stuff. So you wipe them all off, and then you seal yourself back up again. Um, but on this particular night, uh, I was especially worried because we'd just eaten that snake. And the snake was, was delicious, but my, I'm looking around the place and I'm thinking, you know, my snake karma is probably not that good right now. And there's, uh, you know, there's holes everywhere in these little huts. And that very night, like, you know, I, I wrap myself up in the sleeping bag as tight as I can. That very night, sleeping bag comes off of me. I wake up and there's this thing laying across my chest. It's like this big around and I can just feel it. It's completely dark, so I can't see anything, but it's just, I can feel this thing laying across my chest. So I grab it with my 
left hand and I throw it off of me. And, but as I throw it, I roll with it. So somehow I'm wrapped up in this thing. But I manage to get it pinned down with my left hand. And then I, tr I try to free my right arm so I can pin it down with two hands, but I can't move my right arm. And it's at this moment that I realize that I've actually pinned down my own right arm like this. <laughs> yeah. and, and, uh, and what had happened is my arm had fallen asleep and it was across me like this. So, <clears throat> so there actually was no snake. And uh, then I had to explain to these people with very little language. I have very little language abilities. And I had to explain to them, you know, why I was wrestling with my own arm. And this went on for, I mean, this is like, it sounds really funny, but this was like the beginning of the worst moments of my life, you know, like, like I was living in this place for months and, and it was, and basically I, it, you know, people talk about culture shock. What culture shock is at its worst is like this complete loss of self. Like you just feel like you've lost everything. You've lost your identity. You can't express yourself to anybody. You're, nobody gets your jokes. Nobody gets what you're wearing. Nobody understands anything about you. And basically, well, the beauty of this for an anthropologist is that you suddenly have to relearn everything. And it's a great learning experience, right? And the one thing that I noticed here, the thing that really stood out to me, was being a child of the MTV generation, being such a mediated kid, growing up in a place without media, again, right? I had to recreate myself in a place without any media. And that became my focus. I was really interested in, like, identity and how it was essentially mediated, how, how, how identity is built differently in a place without media versus a place with media. And it turns out that it's so different that you can't even really talk about identity here. Like, it's totally different. They're much more relational. They're not really thinking about individual identity in the same way that we are or that we might. And I think that's all mediated. So just as soon as I started talking about that and thinking about that, um, the writing actually came in. And so for the next 10 years that I was studying there, and I was going back and forth over the summers and that kind of thing, and then I stayed there for one year from 2002 to 2003, and that was the key moment when writing really became, came in in force. Uh, and it came in uh, not through like books of science and that kind of thing, not through content really, but it actually came in through the census and mapping and things like that. So this is actually a census exercise. And a few things really started to stir in the community. Just, it seems like such a simple thing. They just come in and they start, they, they just want to count the number of people in a village, right? But it has a tremendous impact. The first thing that you notice is that as they're trying to list people in the book, it's really hard to do because it turns out that a lot of these people don't have names that can go into a book. Most of the people there just had many, many different names and their names were things like mother, sister, brother, friend, like, they were relationship names, right? They were names that one person would call somebody else. But they didn't have, like, this sort of, like, abstract name that worked in all conditions that they could put in a book. So they actually had to invent that. They, and so they actually invented these names, which they call census names. Um, so, like, I mean, they borrowed the English word census name, and, the, and that's what they use now. The census had another impact. Um, before the census, the villages were built much like the village you see up on the top. And that is in sort of, a, it looks like a haphazard way until you get to know what's happening. And what's happening there is that people tend to face their doors towards people that they are closely related to, people that they sort of uh, are connected with in some way. Um, the one on the bottom is what they started building after the census. And these houses are numbered and they're in straight lines and they're built, you know, sort of like, it's sort of like, they're sort of like, uh, by the book. They're sort of built by the book. And those, <coughs> those numbers are numbered so that they match the census book. And this is what the census book looks like on the inside. So essentially the whole culture is sort of literally being rewritten. Um, and why is this happening? Well, the, the big push for the census is that um, the census is used by the state to count the number of people so they can figure out how much funding they're going to give these different places. And so the local people themselves get really into it and they want a large population so they can get the so they can get the uh, the census numbers up so they can get their money and that's the formula that they use there uh, in the government and then one other change that happened and I could just go on and on and on actually with all this stuff <clears throat> but one other change was that uh, this is what you what you see here is like when they're having a debate or some problem comes up in the village they used to come out into this village center and they would talk talk out their problems and try to fix the relationship when the books came in, they came in with law books as well. 
and now suddenly people would actually uh, uh, have to go inside a courthouse and face the letter of the law instead of fixing relationships. It's now an individual against the letter of the law. And so basically all of that unfolding in the last 10 years or so has completely changed this society in ways that nobody really intended. And by analogy now, I'm like, I'm really concerned about new media and the changes it might bring upon us in ways that we don't intend if we're not fully aware of how this media might be changing us. So, um, so I'm going to go to this next. I'm, I'm hearing weird things. Do you guys hear weird things or does it sound good out there? Okay. Is that what it is? <laughs> Do you guys hear me okay? Okay. <clears throat> All right. So back to this idea that this is what we make of it. And I mentioned earlier my concern with an environment that has this message in terms of education. And I think it's pretty clear that these things really don't make sense in a world of almost ubiquitous information. And the type of like tremendous information onslaught we have, the idea that information is scarce and that you have to go to an authority to find good information, all those things are basically not what we're after. And yet we build these classrooms that are essentially built on the model that to learn is to acquire information. And I want to point out, this is a, a point that's actually an old point from Nona Lyons, 1990. She used to talk about nested epistemologies. What she's talking about is basically like um, the, the epistemology, the idea that, of learning and knowledge that you bring to the classroom and that the classroom brings to the room as well actually sort of infiltrates the students. And the students will take on that view of learning that you bring to the classroom and that the classroom sort of instills in them. And so we really have to be careful about the environments that we create. And one of the things that most of our environments create is a space in which most of our students become what, what Belinke and Clinchy uh, uh, and others used to call receptive knowers. And receptive knowers are just people who think there is an absolute truth out there and that the authority on the stage is the one who knows it and I'm just waiting for them to give it to me. And then I'm just going to memorize it and that's it. And as you can see, like, that's a pretty dangerous position to take in a world of, of information onslaught because there's a lot of information out there and they're going to need some tools to figure out what's good information and bad information. Um, fortunately, this information onslaught has a certain type of, uh, of a impact on these students so that a lot of your students will actually come to the room not being receptive knowers but being what Belinke and Clinchy call subjective knowers. That is, They've, they've come to the point where they actually don't believe in any truth, really. They think that everything's an opinion. They think their opinion's just as good as anybody else's. And we, but we, there's also room for growth there, right? Because these are students who are just sort of too, turned off by authority and turned off by the, almost turned off by the idea of learning. It's just like there's all these truths out there and they, and they don't really respect anyone over another. So generally what we're trying to do in our classes, I think most of us, we come from dis different disciplines, but each one of us is trying to turn our students into what they call procedural knowers. We're trying to give them tools. Maybe some of us try to give them like a new language that helps them see new insights. So we might give them, uh, it may be like a set of formulas and things like that that we're trying to teach. In some way though, we're giving them procedures that help them see new things, determine fact from fiction, uh, and those types of things, right? Those are different procedures. And we're hoping that our students become procedural knowers. And our best ones do. The problem with procedural knowing, though, is that it's limited to the classroom. And a lot of times, procedural knowers, students who have reached that level, basically see themselves as good students, as somebody who can play the game. But they just see it as part of a game. And they're really good at that game. They're good at doing that thing. But they're not integrating it into their everyday life. And that part of that is also. Um, sort of the nature of procedural knowing as it's taught in, in most classes. And that is that it's a particular form of procedural knowing, which Belinke and Clinchy call separate knowing, which means that you sort of step back and you objectify what it is you're studying, and you look at it objectively. And, and that, that way of separating yourself from the thing you're looking at is this sort of critical way of looking at something. And that's a great way to look at something, but it's not, it's not going as far as we need to go in terms of teaching and, and education. So what, I'm, what I've been talking about is this idea from Belinke and Clinchy. They wrote this, uh, there was two other authors on this. In 1986, they wrote this book, Women's Ways of Knowing. It's this really great book 
Uh, and what I love about it is that it talks about learning as a transformational process. And I think when you really think about what we're trying to do in the classroom, it's not even, it's not just about content, it's not even primarily about content. We're actually trying to create a different type of learner. And that's precisely what they kind of map out for us. What they point out is that students tend to come in as receptive knowers. We can e usually fairly easily get them to subjective knowing, um, where they start to question a lot, they question basically everything. But we need to get them past that moment of questioning everything to this point where they actually have a procedure for you know, determining fact from fiction and seeing new insights and those types of things. But this is where it gets interesting, is they point out that there's really two types of procedural knowing. There's that separate type that I just talked about where you objectify something and you look at it objectively, but there's another mode, and that's the connected mode, where you actually try to like really connect with this thing that you're, you're looking at. You almost view it as a subject rather than an object, like a living thing, and you're trying to get to know that living thing from the inside. You're actually practicing empathy instead of critical analysis. And if you can actually unite these two, like if you can do both like that empathic thing of like really connecting with it and seeing it from the inside and being able to step back and see it objectively, if you can do both, then that helps you move on to the fourth stage, which they call constructive. And what's so powerful about constructive is that you no longer just have a few procedures at your, you know, that you can use. You suddenly notice that you can create new procedures too that procedures are just there as a tool and you can always create new ones. And if we can get our students to see that, that's when you can almost just step out of the way, right? You've, you've fully like initiated them as true learners and you can just like let them go because off they go. They have this great quote about this that I thought really captures this. They say the student who is constructive says they feel responsible for examining, questioning, and developing the systems that they will use for constructing knowledge. And you could throw into this, this area so many things that go beyond critical thinking. You know, like we talk about critical thinking all the time, but I really think we need to go beyond that. We need to talk, start talking about, can our students do what if thinking? Can they do inventive thinking, creative thinking, and connective thinking? And most importantly, I think, is this idea of participatory thinking, where they really see themselves as a part of what it is that they're studying, and part of the world, and that, and that they are connected in those, those ways. So this is my call for students to think and work creatively and collaboratively. This is a quote from somebody who thinks this is a bunch of BS. Um, <laughs> this is from the latest Doom pedagogical fad, 21st century skills from Jay Matthews in the Washington Post. And, and what, he has some really good points. And his, his main point is this. How are millions of students struggle, still struggling to acquire 19th century skills in reading, writing, and math supposed to learn this stuff? And that's actually a pretty decent point. I think it's something we all struggle with. It's that, that old question of like, you know, when you start engaging this, when do you get time to do the other stuff? And this is actually an old revolution as well. You know, when he says it's like another fad, it is indeed just another fad. If you go back to 1957, and you know, you have Sputnik come in 1957, suddenly the US is on alert, and like we're falling behind, you know, we're falling behind the Russians. And so they call together all these great educationists, all these great teachers, as well as great scientists, and they say, okay, we need to revamp uh, schools in the US. And they meet at Woods Hole in 1959. Uh, and from that, they, they, uh, Jerome uh, Bruner comes up with the process of education in 1962, sort of sets the groundwork for a lot of the educational philosophy we'd see soon after that. But what's really interesting is that there were a lot of people not happy with what Bruner was saying. I mean, it was actually, Bruner says a lot of things that sound really good. For example, um, the basic model that came out of the Woods Hole Conference was that we don't just need to like come up with a list of content that our students need to know. We need to teach them how to think, which sounds a lot like what we're saying today, right? It's the same revolution that we see today was happening back then. Um, but a lot of people didn't think Bruner went far enough. So you had people like John Holt in 1964 who wrote this book, How Children Fail. And by the late 60s, we had all these books like this, uh, Death at an Early Age, Jonathan Kozel, Teaching as a Subversive Activity by uh, Neil Postman and Charles Weingartner, and Pedagogy of the Oppress Oppressed by Paulo Freire. All of these, from, like following Bruner, uh, were saying basically Bruner had a lot right, but he had something really important wrong, and that is that students learn what they do, and so long as we have them sitting in chairs like this, if you ask, like, what are they learning sitting here, then they're learning all of this, these things. Right? So no matter what you do with the curriculum, so long as you're putting them in these types of classrooms, 
they're essentially going to be learning these things. And there was a lot of like um, things said, like this, like this type of environment is soul murder. That was Alfred North Whitehead said this. Um, it, it is like this kind of thing. It is like this feeling of like, you know, death to learning. It becomes um, something else altogether. So Neil Postman uh, summarized this whole revolution by saying that he said, this is from, uh, he's writing about this in the 70s. He says, they ripped into the curriculum, the regimentation, the industrial mentality, the grading system, standardized tests, school bureaucracy, homogeneous grouping, and all the other assumptions and conventions which gave the classroom its peculiar character. Now that's like exactly what we are raging against today, right? And this is written, you know, this is, this is we're talking about a revolution 40 years ago, and then suddenly it was over. And he wrote this in 1977 in a book called Teaching as a Conserving Activity. He's the same guy that co-authored Teaching as a Subversive Activity 10 years earlier. So he basically wrote his own anti-book. Um, <laughs> and he actually summarized why that revolution failed. He took, did a little quick little survey of like why things had happened the way they did. And he pointed out, well, you had the war ending, mainly the Vietnam War. So there was a lot of like the, the revolutionary impetus was gone. There's a stagnating economy. There's a lot of utopian hype. Uh, a lot of the initiatives were really difficult to implement. And then there was also a back to basics movement on, on the rise. And if you look at 2010, you know, there's a war ending, stagnating economy, utopian hype. <laughs> <effect. laughs> so this is part of the back to basics movement. Um, Mark Bauerlein's The Dumbest Generation, How the Digital Age Stupefies Young Americans and Jeopardizes Our Future. And it's just like one of many um, books out there on sort of on that side of the fence. And I think there are actually reasonable arguments here. And I think if we don't accept these arguments, we can't really move forward. Uh, the back to basics critique of new media literacy looks like something like this. One is that it's pandering to students, uh, which is to say like students love new media. So of course you're gonna put it in your classroom and they're gonna love you for it. Um, secondly, it neglects basic literacy skills. That's back to that, you know, how can we teach them this new stuff when they're not even getting the old stuff? And third, it's difficult to implement. This is their best argument, I think, because there are a lot of very expensive one-to-one -one laptop programs and all kinds of uh, technology initiatives that are very, very expensive. And given what they cost, it's questionable whether or not they have the, you know, the results that you would want. Um, now, it's interesting to look at the other side. The new media, media literacy critique of back to basics looks something like this. Um, basically, we look back on them and say, they're the ones pandering to students. Because uh, students actually love to sit in nice, neat rows and memorize uh, stuff for exams. Um, secondly, they're the ones neglecting basic literacy skills because we have to expand our, what we think of as basic literacy. And third, it's their program that may be difficult to implement. Um, and that's simply because you don't get the student engagement. You know? So we get these types of problems um, in the traditional mode. So, the real challenge here is this, like, and, and this is more than anything why I'm, I'm not down with the back to basics thing, because I think back to basics really ends at stage three. I think stage, like back to basics definitely gets you to stage three. Uh, you can basically create really good procedural uh, students uh, through, by doing like old school teaching, but you can't get them into that constructive creative phase with, by doing that, and that's why I'm engaging in this other, uh, other mode. So I'm gonna um, share with you some of my answers to this question, how can we create students who can create meaningful connections? I'm just gonna share with you some stuff that I've done in my classes, and the main themes that you're gonna see is that I always try to engage real problems, something that like extends outside the classroom. Like if it's only relevant to the classroom, it's not relevant enough, it has to be relevant to the world in some way. Secondly, I always do it with students so that the students feel like they're a part of it, like that we're working together on something. And then third, I always do it recognizing and harnessing the existing media environment. And I do that mainly so that students can recognize and harness it as well. And that's like the twist because most people think, you know, you do this because students, that's where students are at. But that's not actually true. Students are not there. They're on Facebook and they're doing those types of things. But they don't, they don't really know how to use these things uh, to you know, create and to um, and to uh, to do to do some really like powerful learning. So they're really good at educating themselves on, or entertaining themselves online, but not necessarily educating themselves. Um, one other point I want to make is that there really are no natives here. Most of these tools are you know less than five years old, and so we're all 
you know, trying to figure out what to do with them, students and faculty alike. So I want to start off with uh, this class, and this is actually going to resonate a lot with what Lynn did with her class. Um, the first step in like creating this type of collaborative environment and uh, environment where you're going to move students towards like actually creating something is really is just getting them like feeling good together and getting a few of the basic skills and those types of things, making them feel connected. So one of the things we did, um, this is actually from this semester. So about four weeks ago, uh, we've been, we're, in this, we're two weeks into the semester now, and four weeks ago we all started uh, just emailing each other and we started up a Facebook group and we decided we were going to get 100 people together on the first day of class. There's only 12 of us. And we decided we were going to get 100 people together on the first day of class. And then we were going to run around campus and do random acts of kindness for people. And we were going to film all of this and then like make a video for YouTube. And the whole point of the video is actually to promote an organization on campus uh, that takes donations from students. And then when a student is in financial difficulty and may have to leave K-State because they don't have any money, uh, this pool of money is there that's been donated by other students, and it sweeps it, so it swoops in and saves the day, and those students can stay with us. So we wanted to promote that organization because most people don't even know that organization exists, and uh, so that's what you're going to see here. So again, it has that element of like it's a real world problem, and it's only going it only takes us like the first day of class to do this. So it's not a big time out, and it has a lot of like great uh, outcomes. So I'll just take you through the video here. I'll talk over it because this is. This is our first draft, and it's pretty rough. So this is our meeting, and you'll see like some money gathering here. This is actually money from the 100 students that we gathered together. So all this money is donated. Then we, so every year they hand out these coupons that look like money. And we gave all of our money to one guy, and now he's got real money. And he's going to stand there with the people who have like this fake money coupons, but he's actually handing out real money. And then the hundred people that we gathered are just inside the doors there, and they basically cheer for people as they come in the door. the lunchroom and we started buying people's lunch and so like she just had her lunch paid for we gave the guy like a bunch of money and he just points to us over there <laughs> okay. now this is the big one um, we actually interviewed this couple and found that they were struggling financially so here they're about to pay for their textbook and here's a like <laughs> And then we just leave without telling them what happened. <laughs> so we actually paid for a textbook. And then you know, this is down in our like little Aggieville place. It's a little hard to see, but this guy was struggling to parallel park. <laughs> this is just at a, at a crossing here. And I can't, can't quite see it, but you just like pick up this girl and carry her across the street.
So anyway, that's, that's our promotion for this organization. <laughs> So that's a pretty good start to the class. <laughs> and that's all been done. You know, that's just in the first two weeks of class. And now this is what we're up to next is um, we have a wiki. And instead of having a syllabus, we have a wiki. And the wiki is actually uh, editable right there. You can hit the easy edit button um, up there at the top. And if you hit that, a little thing comes up and anybody can edit the schedule, which normally would be the syllabus, but in this case, anybody can edit it. And why we let that happen is because there's just this small group of us, and we all have this goal in mind. And the goal is we we're going to create a documentary about a certain subject. In this case, uh, this year's project is on, um, it's sort of like the, the influence of YouTube worldwide. And so each student is sort of picking a different place in the world and thinking about the influence of web video in that place. And they have to make a little five minute video about that. And everybody knows like, the goal. And then you just have to figure out what are the steps to getting to that goal. And if a student says, you know, well, we need to do this before we can do that, then they can come in and edit the, the, uh, the, so the schedule. And the moment they make an edit, it comes to our front page. So we use this instead of Blackboard or, um, or our web, our local web thing. And basically what this allows us to do is we use this wiki out here. The moment somebody updates something, it, the update is summarized right here. Over on the left, we have, this is, all the students have blogs, and we basically just have like a, we have a Yahoo pipe, which funnels every blog post that any student ever does, shows up here in the moment that they post a blog. And then over on the right, we have a place where whenever a student bookmarks anything on the web, uh, it instantly shows up over here. So this becomes like our little hub, which allows us to, you know, recognize and harness this digital uh, media environment. The, the real logic of this is, and like the technology is sort of secondary to, you know, what we're trying to do. Um, Parker Palmer has a great map of this, I think, in The Courage to Teach. He talks about how the traditional classroom is laid out like this, where you have like this object to learn, and then there's this expert uh, who is basically funneling it to the amateurs. And he sort of thinks about it differently in this book, and he instead, instead of thinking about this object to learn, you think about what you're learning as a subject, and it's alive, and it's living and that all of you are sitting around that subject, and you all bring something to it in some way, and you're all knowers. And of course, you're the expert knower in the group, and, and you'll often have to guide in some way in that regard. But, but still, it's, it's giving that respect to, the, to your students and what they already know, and recognizing that what you're studying is not an object to be learned, but a living subject that you can all participate in and, and be a part of. So just to give you a sense of how this is a little bit different than, say, a regular syllabus, in a regular syllabus, I would assign a sequence of readings that I thought were really important to the topic. And I would maybe have two readings a day, and the students would come in, and we would discuss those readings. We do a little bit of that. But one of the really powerful things we do is we have this online database set up, and a student can just, uh, what they do is they, they come in and um, I'll assign, I'll just say, go find five articles on the topic that we're studying. So this time it's web video and the impact of web video on the world. And what they'll do is they'll go out and they'll find five scholarly articles or books. And they have to, they have to put it into the database. They have to summarize it and all of that. And then all of that goes into this database. And then all the students read everybody else's summaries. So each student reads five articles, summarizes them. And then they read everybody's summaries. So by the time we get to class a week later, all the students have read the summaries of 94 articles. Uh, that's, that's what we ended up with this last time. So we had 94 articles. All the students had read all the summaries. And each student had, had really in-depth de knowledge about five of those articles because they were the ones who summarized them. And essentially, we had actually covered most of the literature for that particular area. And collectively, we knew all the literature. It may not be that one of us knew it all, but at least collectively, we knew it. And the, the discussion that comes out of that is so much richer than the discussion around a single article you know, that you're debating over. And it was definitely directed towards like, how can we contribute to this literature? How can we move it to the next level? Um, sometimes you do have a student in your class who really knows his stuff, his or her stuff. In this case, uh, one of my students, Kevin Champion, uh, actually was able to take the JSON feed. I'm just going to say a bunch of stuff that I don't know much about. <laughs> but just so you, it, you'll see how cool it is. Um, he just took the JSON feed from the database, and then he was able to create a different format for it. So as students were uploading this stuff, as they were entering these things, it would go here, 
and all of the tags we were using were over here, and you could click on any of the tags, and then it would automatically update over here and just list the things that were relevant to that topic. And uh, this, these things on the left are actually bringing in pictures from Amazon. So if it's a book, it was actually automatically bringing in the cover from Amazon. And then if you click on any of these, it actually brings up the summary that the student wrote. And so a student could then just navigate through and find all these different articles and read about them. Um, just a little bit more about how this class works. Throughout the class, all the students keep their own blogs, which are like little research blogs. And it's great because, um, I'll just show you a few of them here. What's great about this is that they're open and other people start talking to them because you know, anybody interested in the impact on, of YouTube uh, around the world, for example, is going to start to see these things because they're doing searches and they start to join in these conversations with the students and suddenly they realize like, okay, there's more than just me watching this blog and they start writing a lot better because they realize that it's public. Um, <laughs> finally, we, uh, we put all this together about midway through the semester. We put it all together into a collaborative paper and that just helps us like through the, like writing is a great way to like work through logic and rational arguments and those types of things. And so we use the paper to do that and you can see that all the students share the same Google document each one takes their best three paragraphs that summarizes the core of their argument and puts it in here. And then they try to rearrange it so that it makes a consistent argument throughout all you know, 12 students. So all 12 students, all their papers need to fit together somehow. And that helps us then think about how we can put it all together into a series of videos. Each of the students then for the final six weeks or so of the class. This is, our classes are longer than yours, so <laughs> this seems like a lot. We, we're on a semester system, not a quarter system. And so the students then uh, make these five minute videos. And if you line them all up, they actually make a pretty decent documentary, which is some of you have seen this uh, anthropological introduction to YouTube. A lot of that is actually built up of these little five minute videos that students produced and then lined up together to create essentially a documentary. So uh, the next thing I wanna show you is what I do in a really big class. Um, some of you have seen some of what I do in a, little, in a big class. If you've seen um, the uh, vision, a vision of students today, that was in a big class in which we took a Google document and all the students um, made edits on it and then we created basically the script for this video. And I think most of you have seen this and I wanna show you something uh, that I'm working on lately that I think you'll really enjoy, so I'm gonna skip through that. Um, but that video obviously was very successful. Um, it was, one of the things that was great about this and something that I encourage you to do and I hope you know, Lynn, you've already put yours out on YouTube, right, publicly. It's just so cool because it, even like, if students get even like two or three comments, it, they love it, right? I mean, it's just a huge thing to get it out there and it's, it means so much. And we were just blown away what happened with ours, of course. I mean, millions of people saw it and then it was translated into Spanish, Italian, Greek, French, Arabic. Uh, it was on ABC. All this happening like just in the classroom, like, you know, during the class. So that was a really powerful thing. But of course, this is an anthropology class, and that question came up earlier, like how much time are you really gonna devote to this kind of thing, which is not anthropology, you know? Um, so this anthropology is the study of all humans in all times and all places. And so I'm gonna try to show you how I attack that issue uh, using the techniques I've been talking about. So the first thing I mentioned is that we always try to engage real problems. So here's a class about all humans in all times and all places, and here's what we do. Uh, we take the class and uh, in the past, what you'll see here is like we actually take this imaginary map and we lay it down on the students and then the students are required to like pretend as if they lived in one of these environments and they have to like basically build a culture that looks like a real world culture. Actually, um, starting this semester, we're actually trying it with real cultures now. So we lay a real world map down on them and they have to go to some place on that map and then they become the expert on that place. And they do a, an amazing job at this. They, they become so good at this that by roughly week seven or eight, while I'm lecturing, something really interesting starts to happen is that I have to start assuming that somebody in the room knows more about what I'm saying than I do. And it's actually a really awesome moment. And every once in a while you can actually stop and like, and if you need a little help, you know, cause you're like struggling to put something together, students can, will often like pitch in with some things cause they have this like expertise that they've been building. But here's what we do. Um, when the students then get into these different cultures and they, they have to like build these off of real world cultures. And like I said, today they're actually are using real world cultures. 
And one of the things that happens is all these questions start to emerge very naturally. They start to wonder why it is that you know, 1.3 billion people are living on less than a dollar a day. Because a lot of students are actually essentially living in places now or pretending to live in places like this. Or why 3 billion live on less than $2 a day. Why 800 million are undernourished or over 20,000 children will die of poverty today. And the question becomes why. And that's what I mean by engaging real problems because the whole class becomes about that question. Just like why is the world the way it is? Which is a great way to study the history of all humans in all time and all, in all places. So that's where that comes in. Uh, doing it with students so that each one is actually responsible for some area of expertise. And then they build these uh, cultures like I was talking about. And they do this on the wiki together in teams. And so they're building up this, these, they basically build these 20 page ethnographies up on the wiki of these different cultures. And then this is where it gets really fun. We, uh, with about four weeks left in the class, we create, uh, we start to create a world simulation so that each of the cultures they've created should be a realistic culture as of the year 1450. And then we are going to, what we do is we try to simulate the last 550 years of world history, and then we actually take it 100 years into the future. And what this does is it forces students to think about how the world works. Because if you're going to create a game for how the world works, you have to know how the world works. So we have like a, one committee like studies global economy, and they try to think about, well, how could we create a game for the global economy? And another group thinks about diplomacy and political relations, and they have to figure out, okay, how are we going to game that? How are we going to create a game around that? But the, the amazing thing is they have to learn about the intricacies of these different processes before they can actually build a game about them. And what's really interesting is the way that, you know, the, the research that gets done in this. Um, one of the ways I knew this was working really well was that uh, I saw students starting to highlight and bookmark pages like this, which is actually uh, related to a theory that I didn't learn about until graduate school. And now I had these undergrads, and not just undergrads, but intro students who were taking up this theory because they realized, you know, this could help me build this little part of the game that I'm trying to build. And so they started looking at world system theory. And so this is what it looks like then. Uh, I'll show you this a short video. This is uh, basically the whole thing takes place in a, in a ballroom, a lot like this. And sometimes we do it in a rodeo arena, wherever we can get space. And so you see we're going to move outside of that class. Uh, this is just describing what happens. Students design their own cultures and then create this simulation. You can see it's kind of fun in the beginning. Like students are just kind of going around meeting each other. Up at the top is a Twitter stream where students can update what's happening in the simulation at any time up on the board up there. Now this is a 20 minute video compressed into five minutes. Uh, so it will give you a sense of what happens here. So you'll see how world history basically unfolds here. First you have colonization and all these you know, the colonizers go out and they, with their flags and first take their flags from around the world. All of it looks kind of fun at this point. It gets pretty serious. Here you can see different act, aspects of the of the uh, game and how it works. Here, uh, this is interesting. This is part of the global economy. Uh, it started off that Fruit Loops just represented like fans, and but they became like a really high-priced item, and they started to look a lot like uh, basically like the diamond trade. And here you can see like Fruit Loop necklaces being made all over the world. There's like this global production of Fruit Loop necklaces. And some of the students pointed out that it was a lot like the diamond trade. And so you saw some of the stuff mixed in there using documentary footage from, uh, from pieces about the blood diamond trade and stuff like that. Here you can see, uh, <laughs> it's kind of hard to see, but this is where uh, they're collecting natural resources and things like that, but now some people are getting upset. You can see almost the whole world is, is controlled at this point, is colonized, and now there becomes all these rebellions, and all these rebellions start to happen all over the world. So this actually simulates a certain era in world history in which you see a lot of decolonization. So that's what you're seeing here. But of course, even after decolonization, uh, there is still you know, global inequality. And that's what you're seeing here. We're working in, uh, students point out like different documentaries they've seen in class or outside of class. 
and bring those in to like demonstrate what was happening during the simulation. That's why you see these clips of, of real documentaries being worked in here. Here you can see just some of the inequality that emerged through this process. So now towards the end of the game, things get a little bit more intense. Uh, we're starting to run out of natural resources. Um, there are a lot of wars starting to emerge over the natural resources. And here you can see a lot of strikes emerging, people really discontent. So this group is doing a sit-down strike. And actually in this case, there's actually a genocide too that happened here. So sometimes this gets really dark. But you can see like the students are always relating it back to real world history. What you're seeing here at the end is just students basically trying to save the world, but the structures of the world are making it very difficult. We've created the game in such a way that it mimics a lot of the same structures of the real world. And so it ends in kind of a grim reality. And there's a student holding a sign that says, the end is here. So when you see this like in a 20 minute version, and so what happens is the students do this simulation, then we meet, you know, for, we have four classes after that. We show this video, and then that becomes a springboard for our last four days of conversation, which is essentially like, okay, what went, what went right here? What went wrong? How does the world actually work? And then it's a great like way to get them engaged in that discussion, and also thinking about how we can change the world in the future. Um, I think I'll end with this, that the thing I like about that thing the best, like that, that simulation the best, is it gets 200 students who stop asking what do we need to know for this test, and they start asking what do we need to know for this test. So I'll end with that. Thanks. We have time. We have time for a couple of questions. Are there, or how about comments? <laughs> or ideas. <laughs> yeah, ideas, yeah. Hi. Hello. Hi. <laughs> I was wondering, um, this looks great, and, it, and I think that's really amazing. Um, we have a new thing coming down about assessment, and yeah. I'm just <laughs> curious on how you assign grades yeah. or I'm actually very, do okay. that. So I'm very excited about assessment this year. Oh, <laughs> good. Because, <laughs> so, um, well, this is my, um, basically I, I submitted my tenure packet last semester, so now I'm like free to <laughs> go really crazy with my teaching. And um, one of the things I'm experimenting with is assessment. And has anybody ever used this thing called calibrated peer review. Has anybody ever used that? It's pretty old now. It's like eight years old. Have you used it? So I, I've just started using that this semester. And so far, I really like it. And what it is is, like, so here I am in a big class of 200 students. And the one thing I'd really like to do is, like, have them do something other than multiple choice exams, right? And so that's why I work in all these activities. But at the end of the day, assessment was still about 50% came from multiple choice exams. And that was just because it's really hard to grade that many students on anything. So what calibrated peer review is, is um, what happened, you assign an essay, and then you write three essays yourself, one that's really excellent, one that's medium, and one that's really bad. And you upload these online, and the students then all write essays, and they submit them online. And as soon as they submit their essays, they get six essays back. The first three are the ones that you wrote and they have to be able to pick, pick out which one was the good one, which one's the medium, which, which one's the bad one. And it sort of works like a training process. It's the calibration process. And you build in based on their response. Like if they give your 100-point 100, 100 essay an 80, 
you can build into that say, like a response that says, no, that was, really was a 100 and here's why, and you hit the points. And then if they give the one that should have gotten uh, an 80, like an 80 percent, but they grade it as 100 percent, again, it gives them feedback and says, you know, actually it's 100 percent and here's why. You know, or actually it should be an 80 percent and so on. So they're basically trained by the time they get the three, they get then three student essays and they grade the students. And each student essay then gets graded three times by their peers. And uh, then at the end, they get their own essay back. And if they can get within a certain point range of what their peers graded them, they actually get a boost in their score. So if they can sort of, sort of realistically recognize that, you know, my paper's a C, it might actually bump them to a B overall if they can at least recognize that, yeah, that was C level work. So what I see in it is like, yeah, there are a lot of like, scary things there with like can students actually grade each other but the process uh, is obviously going to be a good one in in helping them I, it's a great learning process right so so i'm pretty excited about that <laughs> and it's worked so far we'll see um, i haven't tried it on a huge scale yet i want to use it as a final exam as well um, but we'll see how that works Uh, I see that this lends itself to certain subjects, but how do you incorporate this? I teach Arabic, uh -huh. elementary Arabic. So how do you incorporate this in subjects like this, where it's very hard, it's very, and you know, God knows how much subjects like Arabic need media and, and uh, yeah. you know. <laughs> yeah, uh, I mean, I have a few ideas, um, but there is, a, I can't think of the blog, but there's a blog out there that's all about uh, it's specifically designed for using these new media in foreign language uh, teaching. And I can't remember the name of the blog right now, but it's consistently in the top 50 of education blogs. So I know that somebody's out there coming up with great ideas that people are, are following. I think some of the real basic ones are that uh, one of the beauties of new media and, and this type of thing is that it should allow students to directly connect with Arabic speakers, for example, like with Skype or something like that, and you could do some kind of exchange. Um, I mean, it's always discipline specific about how you're gonna use this stuff, but um, I think there's a lot of possibility there. So, does anybody know the name of that blog? It's always top 50, I just can't think of who it is. Uh, yeah, if I, th I might be able to find it afterwards, and if you email me, I'll give you the link. Well, I think we'll uh, break now, and Michael will be around for the rest of the day. So if you have questions, please uh, ask him. Uh, we have a few minutes of, of uh, time where nothing will happen. Uh, but <laughs> Isn't that nice? Uh, except those of you that are participating uh, with digital posters need to go and make sure your digital poster's working. And so we're going to give them a few minutes to do that. And so, so starting at about... Uh, 1.15, um, uh, we should go in and look at all the things that people have, are contributing to this uh, conference, uh, what they're using and doing in their classes. So let's thank Michael one more time. <laughs> <laughs>